Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, we'll get started. Oh, it is six o'clock. Great. I just wanted to check. Can everybody hear me okay? Hello. Yes. Great. Okay, good. Hi, everyone. Good to see everyone. And don't forget um, when you're writing in the chat box, if you want everybody to see it, which is uh, which is really great. If not, that's that's okay too. You can write it to all panel to the panelists and attendees so everybody can see it because as you will be hearing um, about tonight, uh, that connecting, even if it's with us here on Zoom, to know that you're part of a community, part of a bigger, bigger group, um, it can already uh, have some effect on levels of stress and anxiety. So um, the more we can connect in our Monday night classes, the better, and um, the, within your own comfort level. So welcome to tonight's topic. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying these Monday night talks, just seeing everybody show up and, and connecting and talking about things that uh, what I'm hearing is really important when it comes to um, living with, managing, treating, healing chronic pain. So tonight we have a really, uh, again, another important topic, anxiety and chronic pain. So we're going to dive into that tonight and I'm going to stop the share for a minute and um, just check in with Mark Lawrence, who's again here from the clinic just to get us started. Um, hi. Oh, uh, mine is really loud. Ooh. I don't, okay. No, sorry. That was just me. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Okay, great. That's perfect. Yeah. Yes. Thanks very much for uh, putting this on again. And just welcome to everybody from uh, from the clinic. And just to say, you know, that this is such an important topic: um, managing fear and anxiety um, in the context of chronic pain. Um, just because if we don't manage it, we know that we're not doing a great job of, of managing chronic pain. But also, um, sometimes there might be an underlying medical cause for the anxiety as well, which um, some patients are afraid to, to seek medical attention for, which it's really important that, you know, you, you bring this up with your, your healthcare provider, because it is really, really important, um, you know, make sure there's no underlying biological cause, but also, um, you know, they can sometimes help you uh, with some tools in managing stress and anxiety in the setting of chronic pain, be because of its importance and its effect on chronic pain which uh, I think we're going to discuss more about tonight. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. I, and also, yeah, thanks for bringing up that really <laughs> important step to not feel like you have to manage this alone. And sometimes there can be, in some cases, actually a biological cause for it am i right uh with like thyroid um imbalances or you know it's just important to to get yeah, that checked out first absolutely i mean there are some things that that could be causing the anxiety uh, some biological things and you know just to go over that with your healthcare provider who probably knows you best i would hope um some of it might just be related to the chronic pain obviously but um, but it is important mm -hmm. to at least look into that and discuss it. Um, and there are not only, you know, the tools that we provide, but there are sometimes medications that might be helpful that, you know, the healthcare providers can help you with as well. So it's, it's certainly because we know the profound impact that, that uncontrolled anxiety and, and any, you know, for that matter, mood disorder can have on chronic pain. Mm -hmm. um, and it's effects on how we manage chronic pain and how we perceive the chronic pain even 
So mm -hmm. yeah, really important. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And we will get started. Okay, so again, welcome everyone to tonight's topic. And um, again, for those of you that are uh, perhaps new, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Madeline Eames and I've been running these Monday night webinars, um, sometimes myself and um, oftentimes interviewing uh, various experts on different areas to do with chronic pain. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, just so you know that. So um, in case you're furiously writing notes, um, you might want to have less anxiety tonight and put down your pen and um, just uh, soak in what we're going to talk about. And the more engaged you can be in this hour, um, the more it's going to kind of um, integrate into your body and you might pick up on, on different things, uh, different angles, different tips. And my, my hope for this hour is to be able to perhaps point you in some directions um, that will be helpful for you in particular uh, in terms of uh, dealing with anxiety on top of a, a pain condition. So um, I, got, I got a little, of course, uh, a, a little practice today, just getting ready for tonight. And because I thought I had already um, had uh, prepared a, a PowerPoint and, and couldn't find it anywhere. And so I thought, okay, well, this is a good, um, this is a good experience for me to have to actually notice for myself in my body how anxiety shows up for me. And we're gonna get into this tonight, just noticing in, uh, in your own body, in your thoughts, in your mind, how, what your fingerprint is. In other words, what is your unique response to stress and anxiety? Because if we can stay curious about that, we can uh, then know a little bit more clearly what we need in that moment. And hit that stop. There we go. Okay, so what I had said here is to take a moment to settle in and just take a few slower breaths. So if this is the only part of the webinar that you do tonight, this is probably the most important. So just for the next minute or two, just start to notice your breath. Just see if you're breathing. And if you can, just start to become aware of your inhale and your exhale. So as you do that, you might just start to lengthen your exhale, if you can. So as they say, when in doubt, just breathe out. As you, as you exhale, I invite you to just let go of, let go of your day so far. You can let it go with a sigh. With that, you might relax some muscle tension a tiny bit in your shoulders, in your jaw. And just perhaps coming to find, find yourself in this moment where you're sitting, maybe even feel your feet on the floor, the palms of your hands, wherever they are. And in the last couple of breaths, we're going to, if it works for you, to take three breaths together as a group. And on the exhale, we're gonna really feel letting go, a grounding with gravity down into our feet, okay? So if this works for your, your in-breath, just start by taking an inhale now, breathe in. And as you exhale, just 
feel yourself grounding down, down into your feet, down into the floor, and another inhale, breathe in. And again, exhale, letting it all melt down, just like these trees in the picture, down into your feet, down into the roots, into the earth. And one last breath in. Exhale, let it all go as best as you can. Letting it all go in kind of a downward motion. And then just return to your normal rhythm, uh, your regular rhythm of breath. And um, perhaps just turning your eyes back to the screen. Okay. So that can be that for people that find that they are not breathing and if it's difficult to take a breath, sometimes just focusing on the exhale can get that breath going again. And you'll find out as we go along how, um, how Im important that's going to be. All right. So have you ever been told Two. I remember when you're writing in the chat to panelists and attendees, I'm getting lots of messages, but uh, um, have you ever been told to just calm down or don't worry, everything's fine. So I want you to think about that for a moment and what it feels like to be told to just calm down. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna ask you, did this feel impossible to do in the moment? And did it make you feel kind of like this? Like it's impossible for me to just turn a switch and calm down. So if you have felt that way, if you did, I just want you to know that that is totally normal, first of all, to not be able to turn a switch. If we could do that, if we could just turn a switch and calm down, well, we would have done that by now. But there are reasons why that is so uh, difficult to do. And in fact, it almost feels like when you try to do that, uh, yeah, as Courtney says, it can actually make you feel more anxious because now it's like you're fighting against yourself. It's like you're fighting against your own anxiety. So why is that? Well, anxiety and worry itself, anxiety, it is a normal function of being human. So um, it, it is something that we need. We do need to have some anxiety in our lives and we need to have some stress in our lives. So when we look at the stress response, you know, the kind of gearing up of the um, sympathetic nervous system, it's probably what got you here on time tonight. It's probably what got you out of bed, got you uh, motivated to do what you needed to do. And anxiety, you know, can help us to meet deadlines if we have them. It can help us rise to um, voice and opinion it can help us move towards what is important to us. So um, if we're looking to get rid of anxiety from our lives, that uh, is not gonna happen and it, it probably shouldn't happen. <laughs> um, so it's really impossible to turn a switch and turn it off immediately. And uh, yes, especially during, during panic attacks. And in fact, when you're having a panic attack and you're trying to turn off the panic, what? tends to happen, often you get more panicky. So we're gonna talk about that tonight um, in the way of regulating, balancing, as opposed to getting rid of or eliminating. Mm -hmm. Makes it worse. But it can also send our rational think thinking, logical mind um, offline when we have ongoing stress and anxiety. And we're gonna also talk about this relationship between anxiety and pain and how both 
can make our thinking brain go offline, can make our thinking brain go offline. Um, for example, I often say, you know, when you've just stubbed your toe, which might seem like a small injury, but it causes a massive amount of pain, that's not the best time to be making be your, your best decisions because you're in a different part of your brain. And yes, fighting anxiety um, can, make it, can make it worse for, for lots of reasons. So stress and anxiety can literally cause us to flip our lid. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on this. Just uh, at the, right at the beginning, this is a model from a um, psychiatrist called Dan Siegel that uh, you may, some of you may have heard of. He's written some wonderful books called uh, Mind Sight. And um, he, what he, <laughs> how he explains it, when you have too much stress, too much anxiety, if you all want to just take your fist like this in front of you right now. And if you think about it, that your fingers, you can tuck your thumb, right? And just do this with me because when you're actually involving your body, you, got, it, you tend to remember better. So just take your thumb and fold it into the palm of your hand and then fold your four fingers over your thumb. So when we're in a calm, rational, um, regulated state of mind, state of nervous system, our four fingers are our prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of our brain that is responsible for rational thought, um, the, ability to, uh, um, the ability to think and make good decisions. And um, when the prefrontal cortex is engaged, and I'm sure you've all had those moments where you know, you're on it, you're thinking clearly, um, that's when we have this part of our brain on board. In other words, if I put you under a brain scan, the prefrontal cortex would be lit up because it's being used. So what happens when we are under too much stress, too much anxiety and um, pain and too much pain or for too long. What happens is we literally flip our lid. So if you can flip your fingers up, we now have our thumb in charge. And our thumb is, uh, represents the amygdala or the part of our brain that is kind of our emotional center of the brain. So this is when um, the big emotions rise, like the anger, fear, anxiety, sadness. And it's a really difficult time to make good decisions. So when somebody tells you to just calm down, when your amygdala is, when your thumb is running the show, I can promise you <laughs> that it is almost impossible to just do that. So what we're gonna learn tonight is ways of being able to tuck the thumb in and bring our prefrontal cortex back on board as best as we can to regulate our um, stress levels and to better be able to regulate our pain because they're so, so interrelated. And so you would see someone flip their lid when, um, uh, if, so if you have, if you ever, ever experienced or seen someone with road rage they probably have a tremendous amount of anger and stress in their body. And that is the straw that broke the camel's lid, basically. And so that is what, what is happening when, um, when you feel out of control. And that is why it's so difficult to just calm down. So I'm gonna be referring back to this, but I think it's helpful to know what's happening in the brain and that it's not it's not your fault, you know, but it is our responsibility to learn tools to um, be able to bring those, those fingers back on board. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to really go easy on yourself here. And um, we can, to know that we can start to become aware of our anxiety and then make those choices in that moment to bring your lid back on board, basically replace your lid. 
by simply, not, not simply always, but uh, it's simple, but it's not easy. Becoming aware of the fear and what you need in that moment to start to self-regulate so that you're not always worried that someone's going to uh, push your button. So just remember that right now in this moment, in this step, in this breath, that you are in fact safe. And the reason I'm saying that is because you can usually think of a handful of times in your life where you actually were in imminent danger. Some people have had no experiences like that. Most people have had a couple. But when you think about your lifespan, usually it's a, a couple of moments. But our nervous system takes some convincing to let it know that to remind you that right now when I look around my room, I'm actually not in danger. Now, why do I say that? Because your nervous system, your amygdala, your thumb, can't tell the difference between being chased by a grizzly bear and um, being criticized by your boss or you know, being um, chased by a tiger or being in an argument with someone. So the effect on the nervous system is this kind of dysregulating uh, a feeling of being in danger. And if you guys have been in a few of the classes already, what do we remember about what the purpose of pain is? I'll leave you with that question for a moment. Because why do we continue to feel unsafe? You know, even when I know I'm safe. And that is because we are wired for it. Um, in some of the webinars, we've talked about uh, pain as a, um, yeah, thanks Paul, a warning system. It's a warning system for danger. And fear, anxiety is also a warning, a warning system. So, Anxiety and pain. Let's just go through um, a couple of the facts here. So is anyone here not anxious about their pain? Well, I'm assuming if you're here, you're probably looking for some help with anxiety. But I, I'm not sure if you would find anybody, even outside of this webinar, who doesn't experience some anxiety around their pain. And why? Because pain is doing exactly what it was designed to do, however faulty um, it might be in chronic pain, to gear us towards uh, protection from a perceived threat. Now, that might sound very similar to a definition of anxiety, because they go together. And in fact, one feeds on the other. And why is that? I, I really want you to hear this, that we produce pain and fear in the same areas of the brain. But the brain doesn't always know which is which. It's just, it's firing messages. And it's interpreting and it's perceiving, uh, trying to perceive what's going on. And um, its default is to send out a message of anxiety or send out a message of pain because everything is geared in us towards survival. So nothing will trump survival. And um, if, you're, if you're getting a little confused about chronic pain and the messages around pain, um, I really encourage you to take one of our pain education classes because that's gonna be really important in helping to alleviate your anxiety about pain. So as pain becomes chronic, it is really natural for the brain, that area of the brain, to start to actually become more fearful. Um, again, for lots of reasons. One is that that area is lighting up um, and sending those, those pain messages. But also, I mean, you guys know when you're having a lot of pain, unless you're really, um, it's counterintuitive to automatically know that you don't need to be anxious. 
or that you are safe in your body. So it really requires that information, that education around what pain is, and then the tools to regulate your nervous system. So if you're feeling like this is difficult work, <laughs> again, it's simple, um, it's not really, but it's not easy. It's not easy work, but it is possible to be in pain and not have the anxiety, just as it's possible to have a very low pain day and continue to have anxiety. So it doesn't mean that the two have to always go hand in hand. Once we learn how, you know, some tools to get on board to manage it and absolutely treating one, I think, um, Mark said this earlier, treating one absolutely helps the other. So this, what we're doing tonight is actually a very powerful doorway um, into pain management. Because when we're in pain, sometimes we can't use our old ways of alleviating anxiety and stress. If we used to perhaps exercise or um, Maybe we were in a workplace, which we don't have as much of now with COVID. And so when we don't have those um, ways that we used to have with pain, then we need to find new ones. And also when we are isolated, anxious thoughts can become bigger and more real. Um, this can uh, you know, definitely amplify uh, the pain experience. And again, when we're having less social contact right now, you may find and, you know, sometimes I even forget like that we are in COVID. So there's a reason why stress levels, even though it may not be um, really obvious to us are a little bit higher. So if pain makes us believe that we're in danger, um, then it would follow that we would have more fear and anxiety. This is kind of what we're up against. And also there can be a lot of uncertainty right, with the chronic pain journey, with the chronic, the journey of the path of chronic pain, anxiety loves uncertainty. And because when human beings are uncertain about outcomes, um, it can make us very uh, fearful. Okay, so I guess the question sometimes becomes, did anxiety cause or increase my pain or which one came first, vice versa or vice versa? Did I have a more pain today so I'm more anxious or was I more anxious today so then I had more pain? Well, the truth is, I guess the real answer is that it, it is both. And they're like flip sides of, of the same uh, coin. So anxiety can definitely amplify or, um, it, well, I'll ask you guys, do you notice a relationship between anxiety and stress on one hand and physical pain on the other? Do you, have you made that connection um, in your life, in your body yourself? And you can answer in the chat if you like. So some people have, huh, just take a moment and ask yourself that. Have you noticed it? So definitely, yeah, absolutely, yes. When I'm anxious, I have more pain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you can see very clearly in your own life how that overlapping happens in our, uh, in our brain and nervous system. That being said, I want you to hear this, that we always try to um, repeat this in classes that if you have been told that your pain or your anxiety is all in your head, that's, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? So I'm not telling you that because you're a worrier or because somehow that this is, you know, your fault. What I want you to hear is that it happens in the brain and it happens in the same part. So um, that is very different than, you know, the for unfortunate uh, ones who have heard it's all in your head, i.e. you're making this up. That's not, that's not true, not true. So um, it has been necessary for survival. So humans who worried and 
scanned the environment for threat, those were the ones that survived. So our ancestors were the ones that probably in caveman world had anxiety disorders, but it was very different back then because there was more threat to their physical safety in their environment and they survived. So um, the truth is that we haven't, we haven't been able to evolve fast enough yet to realize that most of the time we're not in imminent danger. So it's almost like a, like a glitch, I would say, that keeps on going. So we really need to almost trick ourselves sometimes out of it to realize that, oh, okay, this is what the message is that I'm getting in my thoughts or in my body, but it's actually not happening right now. Actually, right now, I, I am safe. And often, you know, I'll have people come to me for, for various reasons. And I've, I've listened to, to many, many stories of life stories. And um, there will be a lot of problems. And the moment that, you know, we calm the nervous system a little bit, and we, they can see that those problems, yes, there's things going on, there's challenges but they're not here right now in this moment. They're not, they're not here. They're here in a thought form. That in itself can already create a little bit of distance between yourself and your fear. And sometimes just getting out of that, that um, hamster wheel there's, uh, can help to just separate or give some space between you and your thought patterns that might come in the way of, um, you know, either looking around, noticing I can see clouds outside, um, just those very simple things to kind of just stop the hamster wheel for a moment. But we're, we're going to get back to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. So first of all, knowledge about chronic pain is crucial. When you realize that your pain is also an overactive danger signal, you can learn to manage it and not always respond in fear. So it's like that fire alarm, smoke alarm that keeps going off. It's like, is there a fire? Okay, no, no, okay. So it's just a, a very sensitive fire alarm. Um, or uh, um, when we understand that acute pain, when we have a broken bone, is very different than a chronic pain condition. Uh, that piece of information is really important so that we don't always respond as if we're having a fire, okay? So anxiety itself is this feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, an unease. <clears throat> and we might have that at various times during the day and then return to normal and then have it again and then return to a baseline. But generalized anxiety disorder, and there's lots of different anxiety disorders. I'll just say that and th that we're not gonna get into tonight, um, you know, such as uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, as a, there's, there's a number of them. But a, a generalized anxiety disorder occurs when that feeling of chronic, excessive, uncontrollable Irrational, so you might even know like this is not happening, but I feel it, um, and is associated with surprisingly a lot of different symptoms. But at least three symptoms must drive you batty for six months for a formal diagnosis. So for six months, if you are really battling these kinds of symptoms, I want to absolutely encourage you to talk to someone about it. You know, you don't have, is, it's not a given that because you have pain, you have to have high anxiety, okay? Just like it's not a given that you have to have disturbed sleep. There are things that, you know, we can do about these um, uh, symptoms that will help your pain. So how can we work with anxiety in a helpful way with pain? And I'll start by saying that all the ways that our nervous system attempts to avoid suffering can actually create more suffering. I'll just let you sit with that for a moment. So all the ways that we try to avoid the discomfort 
can sometimes create more discomfort. So that might be by avoidance, it might be by uh, numbing out, um, it might be by um, uh, getting angry, because um, that sometimes feels better than feeling anxious. Um, so I just want to just point that out to start to notice perhaps the ways that you respond to feeling anxious. Probably a better question is, how can we not add more suffering on top of the suffering? So it's the same as when we talk about pain, having the primary pain and then the secondary suffering on top, how we respond to it. It's actually the same with anxiety. So anxiety is not who you are. You don't have to be, I'm a worrier. I'm a, I'm, I'm always being a worrier. I'm an anxious person. It, it's not who you are. It's a sensation that you experience. And what matters is how you respond to it. So in that gap between the anxiety and your response, that's where we have all the power of choice. So what is the purpose? There's a purpose to every emotion that we experience. There's a purpose, except for toxic shame. I always have to say that, except for there's no purpose to that. But the, what, is the, what would you say the purpose of the emotion of anxiety is? Any ideas? When is it purposeful? And I kind of already said that a little bit tonight. Well, it does help us to plan ahead. So if you're a person that's always, you know, what if about the future, you know, you can see it's a very forward moving um, emotion into the future. So it can help us to plan. It can also help to keep us comfortable. So huh, I'm, I'm worried it's going to be cold today. I'm going to put on a coat. It can point us towards what we really care about. If you worry about kids, about your health, if it's your job performance is important to you, you might worry about it. If financial security, which is important to most people, you know, you might have some anxiety about it. So I just want you to see that it point if you, um, we don't tend to worry about things that we don't care about as much, you know? It can tell us what we need. So it can really, we can feel anxious when we're dehydrated, um, when we're hungry, um, when we haven't bre been breathing for a while. Um, we can feel anxious when we need to have a conversation with somebody or when we feel lonely. So it can really point us towards what we need uh, to eat, sleep. When we're not sleeping, we often have um, you know, a mood disturbance or anxiety, uh, breathe, to move, to get outside, to make a phone call, to connect with someone, to relax, okay? So um, it, think about it as a pointer. But what happens when anxiety does not serve a purpose anymore? When is it not helpful anymore? And if you look at this picture of the cat, it's like a, you know, like a deer in the headlights, when our fight, flight, freeze, and I add to that fawn response are on high alert and the, the, the dial is not um, turning off or it's up most of the time in our stress levels, then it's not helpful to our health, our mental, our physical, emotional health anymore. So it's not helpful. And just notice this in yourself when there's nothing I can do about it right now. So if I'm worried about what's going to happen to me in the future, I can't answer that question. And that can put us into our nervous system into a freeze response. When I'm believing a thought that's simply untrue or unhelpful, such as, you know, I, I lost my job, maybe I got laid off or I couldn't work anymore. I'm a complete failure. 
when I'm believing that thought, well, I'm going to feel more than anxious. I'm probably going to feel very depressed. So we're going to really talk about <clears throat> what thoughts you're going to choose to believe and not. Because when you're believing a thought that's untrue, it really becomes um, a, a trap because uh, it's like something that's, it's not even tangible because it's not true, but it lands in your nervous system. So when it takes on a life of its own, in other words, kind of free floating anxiety without uh, any kind of direction to it, I'm just worried when it becomes paralyzing. So when I'm so fearful of moving or I'm so fearful of going into the doctor's office that I almost can go into a freeze response, become paralyzed. And that might be what the cat's doing in this picture. <clears throat> These are all very adaptive survival um, strategies, but they're not helpful when there is no threat coming through the window, coming through the door. When I avoid things that I need to do, in other words, I'm kind of in a flight response. I'm avoiding um, what I could be moving towards. When it makes you feel angry or aggressive or scared and just plain old crappy. Um, so that you could be in a fight response, just irritable, um, angry. And, you know, I, I get it. If this is you, again, I want you to go easy on yourself. It's a difficult body to be in with pain and anxiety. Okay. And also when it affects relationships, when it really starts um, this, you can even destroying or deteriorating your relationships, because it's hard to be relational when you're, when you're highly stressed. And at the same time, being in relationship is really not a relationship, like one relationship, but being in companionship with, you know, friends or people around you can, is part of calming the nervous system. It's not helpful when I'm more exhausted from worrying than anything else. So I can sit here and, and worry myself and completely exhaust myself without doing anything. And also when it makes pain worse or it prevents movement. And the fear avoidance of movement spiral is really, really common in chronic pain for lots of, um, lots of really legitimate reasons. So how do you cope? And I'll ask you there right now, if you could think for a moment, how do you cope with anxiety? And is it working? Uh, maybe there's something that is working for you. I'm going to really encourage this group to, um, there's 41 of us here, to share in the chat if you want to. Don't create more anxiety for yourself tonight. Um, how you tend to cope with it. Maybe it's just one word. Um, and you can also share what, what's working or maybe it's not working. Okay, I like that. Repeating a song, found a peanut. <laughs> That's the one that we probably all know. Uh, there is really something, isn't there, Andrea, to just repeating something to yourself that feels light. Thoughts, thinking about someone who's important to you. In meditation, I'm seeing that. Listening to music. Uh, going outside and taking a deep breath, stand back and observe. I like that. Getting outside for a fresh breath, breathe. Lots of breath here. Yeah, even if it's five minutes. Uh, hiking, meditation again. Walking in fresh air. Okay, I'm anxious, I go to bed. Yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes rest is what is required. And, um, you know, if we're in bed uh, because of anxiety a lot of the time, then you know, probably want to get other skills on top. But if that's what you need at that moment, sometimes it does point us towards rest. So I thought these were two kind of funny quotes. So never in the history of calming down has, ever, has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down on the heels of what we were talking about earlier. So never in the history of calming down has anybody ever calmed down. So 
you know, um, if the people around you say, well, just think positive and, you know, th there, there is some value to being grateful for what we have, but at the same time, it's as if people expected us to will it away. If only we had thought about being more positive, how silly of us. And this is from an article, how I learned to cope with chronic pain. If you are battling your thoughts with trying to think positive, trying to be grateful, um, you might be kind of battling yourself. So we're gonna look at uh, some different ways of dealing with those thoughts, all right? So the anxious state is really being in your head instead of being in your body. And with pain, this makes a lot of sense that we would want to disconnect from what's happening in our body. And then we tend to spend, I think most of us tend to spend most of the time in our head. Often our mind can be very powerful for better or worse. It is geared towards um, perceiving any threat in the environment. So you could have 10 wonderful things happen to you and one criticism comes your way. We do have a bias in our brain, in our mind towards um, that one criticism. So when you look back and reflect, we tend to see the negative things more than the positive. So absolutely, we could work on, on balancing that out. <clears throat> but I'm, um, yeah. So the more that we worry, um, the busier our mind gets. And then it's almost like it, it becomes like a, um, like a rolling stone gathering more and more moss, moving faster and faster. So now we're scan scanning for more dangers, and now we're more geared up and now we've got more pain <clears throat> and um, it can be a real inner battle trying to hold that boulder or that rolling stone on the mountain up. So um, yeah, like somebody says here, it's exhausting trying to catch those negative thoughts. It, it really is like an inner battle. And a lot of the um, therapies that are coming out nowadays are around mindfulness meditation, acceptance and commitment therapy that are less about shifting those thoughts and more about um, being aware of these thoughts and letting them, letting them drift by and not engaging in a war with them. So I'm seeing lots of great comments coming in just to the panelists, which is great. If you wanna share it with everybody, panelists and attendees I see lots of good good uh, tips here so we often as I'm seeing here cannot think our way out of anxiety although um, it can be a it can be an important part of it so overthinking so when we start this ball rolling it, it ruins the moment because we're not here anymore the situation and it kind of churns it it chews it up in all kinds of shapes and spits out worry so it starts to almost take a, on a life of its own. We may need to let that boulder go, not to run us over, but we may need to sh just shift to something else. So becoming aware, and then we can make a choice. So here's where we really get into your unique fingerprint to notice in yourself. And right now, um, just, if you can notice yourself and you there may be something on your plate right now on your mind that you are worried about so as i say that can you notice in your body how worry shows up for you even if you can pinpoint one thing as you think about that worry about how it shows up in a thought or how it shows up in your body. And often I have people actually write this down so they can recognize because often it's the same. So I see tension. Just notice, yeah, can you notice that? <clears throat> so this is the first part, awareness. You might notice 
um, changes. There we go. Yeah. We, you might notice changes in your breath. I see heart rate up, headaches, tension. <clears throat> so there's three different areas where it tends to show up. Your breath tends to change. It might be short, shallow when you think, of, or even like a gasp or uh, breath holding. It might show up in your body, muscle tension. We hold a lot of anxiety in our shoulders, neck, in our scalp, tension, or stillness being, um, oh, there we go, frozen movement. That's a, a really good way of describing it, Chris, frozen movement, frozen movement. So I wrote stillness here, but I'm thinking we're talking about the same thing, that kind of very stiff, um, frozen as opposed to kind of paralyzed uh, movement can create and also show up with anxiety. Thoughts, the overthinking, um, you know, if you go for a walk and you come back home and you realize that, wow, I wasn't even there on my walk. I, I was totally in here. And I don't know about you, but I've done that many, many, many times. Um, come back home and realize I don't even know what happened on that walk because uh, I was totally in my mind. Analyzing, catastrophizing, ruminating. Yes, if, you're, if you've ever driven and um, you get to where you're going and you can't remember how you got there, um, often we're not present in that moment. We're not present for the drive because we are actually caught up in our mind. So here we go. <clears throat> when you find yourself in that battle, I want to start with the very practical basics of your body. And to ask yourself, and this may sound like a simple question, but it doesn't always have a simple answer. What does your body need more of? So just sit with that for a moment yourself right now. <clears throat> what does your body need more of? So I'm seeing oxygen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely on the list. You can feel that. You might need water, rest, healing. You might need nourishing food. You might feel depleted. It might be sleep. What is anxiety pointing towards? Movement, stretching, oxygen. Being with people. Do I need to reach out? Do I have to sit here in my loneliness or my anxiety, or do I need to reach out of the, of the, with the right people? Do I need some laughter? Do I need to put on a comedy? And do I need to be less serious at the moment? Do I need to do some muscle relaxation? And I'll tell you right now, like often that can just on your own or with a guided uh, relaxation, sometimes that's the answer. Pets. There's a lot of research around dogs and um, the, the presence of animals and um, decreased uh, uh, stress and anxiety. So this is very different, different than fighting your mind. Okay. Gentle stretching, I saw uh, someone say as well. Okay, so asking what does my body, body need more of? Not so much what is my mind, we'll get to that, but now what does your body need less of? And I used to teach this class very differently than I do now. Now I start with the body and then we'll move to the mind because I think connecting in with your body, you know, my thumb is not worried and my foot's not worried. It might be in some pain, but when we connect with the, you know, the biggest part of us, maybe our heartbeat um, or our lungs, we can often come out of our mind. Maybe your body needs less caffeine or alcohol. Maybe you need less social media or less sugar. Thank you for that one. Uh, do you need less news or TV? I'll ask you that question right now. Do you need less of that particular person in your life? In other words, um, toxic relationships. It's not always your responsibility to learn how to breathe to learn how to relax your muscles if you're around someone that's stressful. 
you don't have to manage that if the answer is to have less time with that person. So I see someone saying that I need less COVID. Yes, I, I hear you. I definitely hear you. And we all need less COVID right now. Do we need less moving? In other words, more um, um, less sitting, more moving? Do we need less ruminating? Are you in that hamster wheel? I got a shift and a lot of people said to get outside, take a breath of fresh air, a change of environment, a change of position can change your thought patterns. So I'm going at it very differently, more bottom up right now. Okay, so those were kind of the bottom up um, approaches. <clears throat> So yeah, someone just said to us, do something that brings you joy. You have the right to, it, no matter what's going on in the world, um, you have the right to experience some joy and pleasure. Even if it, it's um, a cup of tea, that act of self-care, of self-nurturing sends a message to your nervous system. Even if it feels awkward, that, okay, this system right here is safe. This system, <laughs> this nervous system is having a cup of tea. This nervous system is breathing. That must mean that we're safe. So it might seem small, like very small things, um, but a small thing or numerous small things sends that message from the brain down through the spinal cord that this nervous system is actually safe, okay? So um, I'm going to launch into thinking now that should give you a lot. That might be enough right there. What does my body need? But let's look at thinking. And if um, you haven't done the empowered relief program, we have one uh, starting this Wednesday. I really encourage you to take that because we get into this a lot more. So um, can you remember or can you bring up any fearful thought? You might write it down for yourself. You might just remember, or you might even put it in the chat. A thought that is a um, repeated theme for you, because often our thoughts are repetitive, that causes you anxiety. Okay. So it might be a what if thought. What if this happens? What if my pain gets worse? What if I can't work? I can feel the anxiety of those thoughts. Okay. I'll never, or I will always be like this. So if, if you're having any of those thoughts right now, just remember we have 60 to 80 thoughts, 80,000 thoughts a day. And most of these are repetitive. So if you know what your demons are, um, better to know them better to know the monster under the bed than always be avoiding it. Yeah, so, so there's some really fearful thoughts coming up that I, um, just putting it out there, sometimes can separate you from this thought. What if I end up in a wheelchair? What is my end point in this? What's my end point in all this? Okay. So notice those thoughts right now can't find an answer. Those thoughts can't find an answer. We can't, yeah, I can't do this. I'll never get this done. Worrying about money. Notice these right now, they come up as an effort to protect you from these things, but there's no forward, there's nothing we can do about them right now. So those are the ones that we want to, um, pay attention to, but then don't pay attention to. Let's do that now. So the ruminating is the worry, the catastrophizing, the fear, the fear. What if I end up in a wheelchair, okay? So a little quote from Mark Twain, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened, but we don't know that at the time. We don't, it's very hard to convince your mind of the opposite, okay? Just a quick note, remember that worrying about others does not equal love. And the more that you worry, um, I've often had people say, if I don't worry about this, I'll never solve the problem. Worry does not equal problem solving. And in fact, it's the opposite. 
I think it was Einstein said that you'll, you can't find a solution from the same um, consciousness that caused the problem. So worrying will not help you to solve a problem. Even though it, it pretends that it does. So remember this, that you are not your thoughts and many are simply just not true. So you might start by asking, you know, all these thoughts flowing by and those ones that stick, is this true? Is, is this actually true, this thought? Or is this worry, um, you can also ask, is this worry helpful for me right now? I understand it's there. I know it's trying to protect me. Um, but I often go to the work of someone called Byron Katie, who has a series of questions to ask around fearful thoughts. Okay, so really try to see um, through the thoughts that are helpful, the thoughts that are nourishing, the thoughts that create safety in your nervous system, and the thoughts that don't. And I use safety and danger um, uh, simply because when we feel fear, we feel in danger. So um, if it's a question, a thought that can't really be answered right now, that's not pointing you in some direction towards maybe I should make a doctor's appointment. Okay, well, that's something I can do. Then that is a time to shift to something else. Notice your thoughts. Um, so I wouldn't counter it with the opposite because then my experience is that you end up in a battle. So for example, um, I'll just take the thought, what if I end up in a, in a wheelchair? If I counter that with, oh no, it's impossible. I won't end up in a wheelchair. That just, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. Your body will um, only take and absorb something that it knows can be true. So nobody can say that, um, of course we all hope that will, won't happen naturally. <clears throat> but I can't say that I'm not gonna walk out of the house tonight and by some weird chance, get hit by a car and end up in a wheelchair. It's not a thought I want to think about. But if we start countering it, we start ending up in a, in a, in a battle in our mind. So if it doesn't have an answer, I encourage you to shift. To so know that's there. Yes, that's my story. That's my fear. I see it. And now this is what I'm going to do. And every time you do that, you reroute your neural pathways. So... But the moment you notice it, if you can shift, it's going to get easier and easier and easier. Okay, without fighting. So simple thought awareness or meditations can help to detach from those really sticky ones. And if they're sticky, they're, um, they are um, important to you. They, they pack a punch, you know, those ones that are harder to let go of. Um, and there's a lot of good you know, if we had time tonight, I would do a thought awareness um, practice with you, but um, I'll give you some resources at the end for that. So noticing again, like we just did, what are the thoughts that fuel <clears throat> the anxiety, fuel the story that feed the anxiety, such as, will I be able to work? Will this get worse? And know that what will happen to me? What should I do next? These are all really normal thoughts when it comes to a moving target like pain, because there often isn't a clear path. It's, it's more like a healing can be more like this kind of a path. It's not, it's not like a straight, straight line. So start to notice the thoughts and know that they are exactly that thoughts. And if I had a thought right here in front of me, I always, um, I always uh, give the example that um, if, if a thought was here, I could put my hand through it right now because it's not actually real. It's not actually a thing. It's like a burst of electrical energy and your electricity in your brain, I think. Um, so just to notice that and shift. Okay, so that was 
kind of a nutshell about thoughts, but if you haven't done empowered relief, please um, do that because we really look at uh, catastrophizing thoughts. So the second question I have, I have is what does your worry feel like? What does it feel like in your body? And I asked it earlier, and, um, but if you can feel that now that we've talked about thoughts, um, there might be something else coming up that you're noticing. Some of the things that we might can attribute to worry are heart racing, sweating, a stomach, a stomach upset, stomach aches, tummy aches, a restlessness, um, an inability to stay still, irritability or easily upset, sleep problems. Often it shows up in um, insomnia, uh, difficulty paying attention or concentrating. I see some says headaches. If you have trouble pay, uh, paying attention, often the real estate in your brain is being used up with um, worry or with pain, right? Easily fatigued. This is exhausting and um, often does lead to, uh, can lead to uh, burnout, muscle pain, tension. But the, the main thing I want you to hear is that it's similar to pain in that anxiety makes it uncomfortable to be in your body. And so we naturally try to escape. So this is where I'm gonna suggest that we turn that around to, um, there are times to escape, no doubt, into Netflix or whatever you, you need. We can't do this all the time, but to turn it into some type of um, self-care for, for your body and, um, and I don't mean just bubble baths, but I mean really pointing towards what you need in that moment. I, personally, I've had a lot more people find success with, um, with that approach. Okay, so sometimes it can be as simple as it's hard to have an anxious mind in a more relaxed body. Now I know that we are bracing and we are reacting towards pain. But if we can start to tease out <clears throat> what is the pain condition and what is the bracing um, on top of that, then we can sometimes change our posture. There's been a lot of research around this now. Um, change your posture, posture to a more relaxed to retraining your uh, nervous system, your body to be in a more relaxed state. Okay. So sometimes it's just getting grounded, like right now, feeling your feet on the floor. So we're less up here and we're more down in our toes, in the soles of our feet. Sometimes it's simply lengthening your spine if you are able to or lifting your chin a little bit up if it feels like it's down towards your chest. Just experiment, see what that feels like. You might look up, you might look around. If you tend to be, anxiety can be all consuming. This is also the shame posture, um, down, you know, looking down and in towards the belly button. Um, yeah, so if you, if you can, just looking up slightly and looking around can already shift that, um, post that uh, pattern. <clears throat> See if you can balance your shoulders so you're not too far back and you're not too far forward. These are just suggestions. <clears throat> One thing that I'd like to um, imagine is having a stronger back, a stronger spine, so I'm not rounded, I'm strong in the back, and a softer front. So softer front is more relaxed chest, more relaxed belly. Softer front, stronger back. It's something that I like to imagine I've been, um, and in terms of relaxing the muscles in your front body. And also um, restorative yoga poses. So we're spending a little more time in relaxation than, than um, tension. And I've Put some pictures here sometimes it's just lying flat putting your legs up up uh, up the wall um, 
the legs up the wall pose can be done on a chair like this one here, or you can actually put your legs up the wall if you're only, of course, if you're able to lie on your back. Or just putting a pillow under your knees can be a supportive, relaxing um, stance. Um, in a chair, feeling your sitting bones and your feet on the floor. <clears throat> or the po pose over here with the arms open, just experimenting with that and seeing how that feels if you feel closed. There is a place for being closed. So there's no right or wrong here. But I'm, I'm working a lot more now with the body than with the mind. And I must say that when I'm working with people, I'm finding, um, I'm finding it easier for people to do these types of shifts, okay? Um, because yoga and breathing and mindfulness meditations are all really great. But, and you know, I'll, uh, disclosure here, I am a yoga teacher, so I do have a bias, of course, but I will say that they're not always the answer for everyone. And so only do those things if that's your thing, if, if that's helpful. Okay. <clears throat> so ways to calm that flipping lid in the moment. To notice, like I said with that client earlier, that this particular problem is not here right now. So that future thought of what am I going to do is not here right now. Now you might say, yeah, but it might be here. It, it might be coming. If I stay in a stress state, I'm still not gonna be able to manage that thing even if it comes. If I am in a relaxed state, I am gonna be able to manage what comes my way in a far more positive way because over time, I will have less pain because I have less anxiety. So worrying about it doesn't seem to protect us from those things, okay? So that present moment awareness, oh, that's a thought. It's not actually here right now. Okay, what can I, awareness, choice. I'm really just gonna go make a cup of tea right now. It sounds very simple, but I'm not going to indulge that thought anymore. So sometimes some, setting some um, inner boundaries on yourself. I'm, I'm not going to do, I'm, we're not going to, yeah, we're not going to do that thought. Or not that we're not going to do it. Don't create a war. When it comes up, I'm going to shift and do something that's really good for me right now. Okay, how does that feel? It can make sense to notice what's already here. If your brain tends to take you away from what you have to what may or may not happen in the future. Practicing gratitude for what's here. I know um, there's been a lot of research around uh, um, re uh, journaling morning and night of things that, um, that you're grateful for can shift your brain into a, um, a more relaxed state. Okay, so we are going to go till 7.30 tonight. Just so you know, if you do have to scoot off, you will, uh, you will get the recording. So um, no worries. <laughs> no, wor no more worries here tonight. So rum ruminating sometimes protects us from what we are actually feeling. So this is actually an important uh, point. Sometimes if we create a story about why we feel a certain emotion, why we feel this way, why we, you know, I feel irritated. Oh, it must be because blah, 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 or it must be um, because of that person said this. And so we stay in the story in our mind when sometimes the answer is to just go to the emotion and notice what's happening in your body. So this is a whole other webinar, probably an eight week course in itself, but it doesn't have to be. What emotion is trying to be felt that perhaps you are protecting or bracing against. Now, how have I seen this come up? Because I've seen it many, many times, is that sometimes when we stop the story and notice what's happening in, the, in your body and start breathing, so your lungs expand a little bit, I can give you, uh, I'll give you an example in a minute. Sometimes emotion starts to come up. Sometimes it's a good cry that's needed. Sometimes there's something that needs to be grieved. 
sometimes there's something that hasn't been um, felt, but we tend to put a lid on it and lock down literally in our lungs and our body. That is going, that resistance is going to create anxiety. Okay. So if that does feel, I, it, there hasn't been a breathing class I've taught where there hasn't been tears because it's such a normal and natural response to many things in life, okay? So if that's the case, you might just work through it. You might feel what you need to feel. Don't, don't judge yourself for it. Look at it like a gift. Um, or you might wanna talk about it with someone. You know, there's a lot of support out there or there might be support around you. Therapists, um, you know, getting uh, a counselor or a therapist to work through some stuff with, whether it's uh, stuff from earlier in your life or just changes that have happened to you in the last few years, you know, even coping with chronic pain, um, you know, please get, be good to yourself around that. You, you deserve to, you know, to not, you don't have to do this by yourself. Okay. So, um, Anxiety points us towards perhaps what might need to be done. So do what needs to be done and then rest. And I'm going to give you um, a couple of examples. And these are just ones um, that I thought of today that I thought would help to kind of illustrate what I'm, uh, what I'm talking about. So I'm just gonna check the questions and I can see one here. Um, could we be dealing with fight or flight? We're absolutely dealing with fight or flight um, from Deborah. Fight, flight, freeze, and also fawn. So fawn, um, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, that is the stress response that arises um, in response to anxious, worrying thoughts, and it also in response to pain. That is the overlap in, in the brain, okay, so absolutely. I want to talk for a second about that last word I said, fawn. Um, if you, there are particular uh, personality patterns that can predispose us towards, in other words, set us up for anxiety and also contribute to pain conditions. And those are the perfectionist. So you can just ask yourself, that question, you can explore a little bit about perfectionism. Do you have to get it right or not do it at all? Um, do you feel like you're just never quite measuring up or not good enough? Though that can be a particular personality pattern. And the other one is people pleasing. So if you're, if you need everybody else to be good, to, um, to be happy in order for you to be happy, that can really also set you up for anxiety and um, an amplified pain experience. And uh, when I said fight, flight, freeze and fawn, that last one fawn, what I'm talking about is, um, is the people pleasing response that we may have learned, we may have picked up along the way in childhood. So just a little, um, just a little uh, addition in there, just, kind of ask yourself those things. There's also been a lot of research around um, certain personality types. So before I get into the examples, it's just, yeah, a question here. Can't manage pain, low pain threshold, and I worry too much to cause pain in my stomach. Anything I can do. I would absolutely um, practice deeper, relaxation, I would lie on my back with hands on the belly and breathe into the belly. And if you can try to relax some of that churning that might be happening in your gut. And your gut is a very uh, powerful brain. It has, um, Dr. Lawrence might correct me on this, but from everything that I've read, it actually has more neurons than the brain um, in our in on our head. So it makes sense that a lot of things would uh, show up in our in our belly. Um, when kids are worried, they have a tummy ache. They don't know they're worried. They know they have a tummy ache. So that upset tummy. 
Um, obviously, eating things that um, work for you, um, you know, whether it's uh, um, things to balance your gut flora, such as um, probiotics, that's not my area of expertise. Um, but the relaxation to relax the churning and, you know, you might do something that sounds really woo woo, but putting your hands on your belly and, uh, um, yeah, because the belly is such an important part of the nervous system. When you're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, in other words, your body thinks a grizzly bear is chasing you, you don't have time to stop and eat and digest. So your digestion turns off or slow, sorry, slows down. It slows down. So you're going to have problems showing up in your stomach. So the more you can approach it from a nervous system um, point of view, the more your belly will be able to regulate itself back into um, some kind of balance. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Okay, yeah, um, just a comment from Mark. You've already taken, that's true, the first step realizing that worry is causing your belly ache, right? So calming the, coming at it from a nervous system point of view, yeah. Okay, so um, I wanna tell you about three people really quickly. So first of all, uh, somebody that we'll call Mary came in and said, I just can't get rid, here we go, same as uh, what somebody just asked. I can't get rid of this tight feeling in my gut. So here is um, an example of when we started to um, notice what was happening in her gut and this tight feeling. So we started by um, relaxing and breathing and doing some belly breathing, expanding into her lungs. And what she wanted to do was really get rid of this tight feeling. I encouraged her to, um, I wanna use the word embrace that tight feeling and what she was protecting herself from. Well, what happened after that was a huge release in the form of you know, droplets of water from the eyes. I'm, and I'm, I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but tears is a release of our body that's very normal. And what she hadn't grieved was the worry that she felt for her adult son who um, was, uh, had many addictions and mental health problems. And she hadn't had a chance to be able to grieve and express that worry. So when she was able to release that through tears and talking about it, and she didn't even know this connection had been made in her body, but it has to go somewhere. After, the, it doesn't always happen this fast, but after that session, that tight feeling in her gut was gone. So it's an example of how we run this story of I've got, you know, I've got this tight feeling in my gut. I've got to get rid of this because it's doing all these things. When we can tap into perhaps why it's there, we don't always have an answer. Is there a repressed motion? And release that, we can, some, we can release some of the um, resistance and the uh, bracing in our body. And if, if you think about it, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. Okay, let's look at John. John came in. My work is so stressful. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to keep doing it. He did have a lot of, I remember a lot of lower back pain. He was really worried about his job. It was a physical trade, um, a tr like a, I want to say like plumber or electrician. And so he had a lot of fear and anxiety about the future. Was he going to be able to keep doing this? He had spoken to his boss and his boss had given him the answer that, yes, well, we have, um, we have like, you know, an employee assistance program that, that can help you to learn to relax and breathe and, you know, counseling and this kind of thing. But the problem actually was there weren't enough employees at the company. So he was being worked off his feet with um, chronic lower back pain. So what he had to do was go back to his boss and have a very difficult conversation to say, 
I'm not going to be able to do this job because you actually need to hire more people. This was pre COVID times. This was quite a few years ago. And so what I want to um, kind of describe to you is that sometimes there's a change in your environment that you are coping with that perhaps needs, sometimes it is the environment that needs to change. It's not always you. So just remember that. So he, luckily he had a good outcome and he had this difficult conversation that was really manifesting in his back and it alleviated a lot of, lot of his fear and his boss was more willing to work with him because um, he had to ask for what he needed in order to be able to stay. That's not always the, uh, the case, but um, moving forward, it wasn't going to end up good. So sometimes being able to express and ask for what you need can help. Okay, very last uh, example is um, someone that we're calling Betty, who um, <clears throat> had that fear that a lot of us have, I'm sure a lot of people here have, my pain is so bad right now. What if I never get better? What if I never get better? So if you think about how that thought uh, kind of digests down into the body, there is no answer to that. There, it's what we call catastrophizing that we really target through the Empowered Relief Program. Please, <laughs> I keep on feel like I'm, I feel like I'm doing one of those advertisements, but please take that uh, because we can talk a lot more about that. Um, predicting that worst case scenario. The Really the answer for that, because there is no answer to the question, is establishing safety in the body in that moment to realize that that's a thought. I don't have an answer right now in this moment through my breath, relaxing my body tension, and perhaps, perhaps moving my body or doing what I need to uh, let my nervous system know that I am in fact safe right now. And with that comes a practice of self-compassion that actually has a lot of um, connection with, um, is there's been a lot of research around self-compassion in treatment for chronic pain. So <clears throat> she really learned how to be better to herself in the moment, even when she was having those bad pain days because the alternative of running this story, the fearful story of the future, was just not getting her anywhere. Slowly, little by little, she began to have more and more safety moments in her life, in her day. And with that, her pain started to get more manageable. If that word self-compassion uh, makes you go, ooh, not sure about that, then you actually need to be in the webinar on self-compassion. We have an expert coming in on April 19th, Shelly Prosco. Um, or if it's something that you're curious about, I really recommend coming to that one. We're gonna dive right into it and, um, and uh, look at how we can actually um, start to be our own best healers, our own best uh, supports. Okay, so those are kind of three examples. Um, so Megan says, if I if uh, just ask, if I worry, will it help? It's really as simple as that. If I worry, will it help? Probably the answer is no. Um, and so if your brain is really trained on, on that hamster wheel, it might take a little bit of time to shift to a different uh, route in your brain. Um, but do it every time. And every time you make that shift, you are actually, um, it's like doing a bicep curl. You're building a muscle away from anxiety. As a result, away from pain. Okay. Oh, I wanted to leave you in this last minute um, with... Uh, a practice of box breathing. This is out of all um, breathing techniques. This is just, if you, this one doesn't fit for you to hold your breath, simply just slow down your exhales. But here's one that you can practice tonight 
if you are looking for a breathing technique. Um, so box breathing, you can use it anywhere, anytime, in the elevator, in your bed. And um, what you do is hold your breath for count of four going in a box. Uh, sorry, inhale, hold it, breathe out, and hold it. So it's, it's pretty um, self-explanatory. If you need something to do with your mind at the same time, find a box, uh, find a square, like a door or a window, and just follow very carefully the outline of that box as you're breathing. And don't just do it two or three times, do it 10 times, do it for five minutes. And um, um, a lot of people really find it to be effective. All right, we are at the end. So self-management, says I've got this in one more slide. Find your doorway, your breath, body, or your mind. Start getting unstuck. Um, ask what you need, ask yourself, what do I need? What do I need right now? Maybe it's, you know what I need? I need a glass of water. Oh, because if you're dehydrated, your nervous system is going to be upset. Try different things. Don't give up. Try, if it doesn't, you know, really fit the bill, try something else, something else, something else. Know that if you need rest or decide to just simply let a problem go, you're still doing something. Sometimes letting go is a greater act of peace than hanging on, okay? That's not my problem. I mean, if you're worrying about somebody else's problem, please figure that out. And you might need to let them solve their own problems if that's, you know, what you worry about. Guided practices for physical pain. Find a voice, find a length, <clears throat> and find a type of practice that you like. And here are some suggestions. The other thing I want to add to this is the Curable app. It's called Curable, specifically for chronic pain. Okay, Insight Timer, Calm, our Empowered Relief Program. Dr. John Kabat-Zinn has got some great mindfulness meditations. And I also put lots of YouTube videos because there's so many. Uh, it's hard for me to pick one for, you know, I, I'll usually pick the wrong voice for someone else. So that's an hour and a half of talking about anxiety. I'm going to stop to share here and come back. And I do want to, if you guys need to zip off, although everyone is still here. Wow, that's awesome. Well, maybe it's not awesome because everybody, I think, struggles with anxiety. If you have any questions um, before we sign off for the evening, please uh, just put them in the chat. Uh, this is probably something we could talk about uh, for a long time. And um, you can always send me an email uh, if there's something else that you're kind of wondering about. I, on my own my private website um, outside of the Bill Nelms Pain Clinic, I do have some free videos. And the website, if you are, uh, you know, um, interested, it's called Mindful Living Now. Um, so I like this. My mom taught me when I was very young to think about the brain as having separate compartments that you use a duster to clean. Doing this, doing this really did help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that, separate compartments. Um, so yeah, reach out if you want any further follow-up, any other resources, but try those ones that I suggested. And um, coming up, we have Empowered Relief, the two session class that is this Wednesday and the following Wednesday. Um, in, okay, next Monday, uh, we have Mary Ellen. Mm, no, sorry. Next Monday is Easter Monday. The following Monday, we have Mary Ellen who's coming back on to help us with the shifting thoughts to shift pain. I hope, um, uh, you might be there for that. And the following Monday is around self-compassion and self-care with, um, uh, with, uh, one of our expert uh, teachers, Shelly Prosco. I'm 
so excited that she's going to be able to join us. She's coming to us from, I believe she's from Saskatchewan. And then the following Monday, we have Chris Thomas back with sleep. So I hope since our last webinar, you may have been able to um, improve your sleep. If you haven't been able to, please come and, and problem solve with Chris because that's why he's coming to, to answer questions um, that have come up around sleep or obstacles, barriers to getting a good night's sleep. So uh, register for all the webinars, Andrea. And because uh, and, if you can't show up, you'll still get the recording. All right. So you'll get the recording for this. Thank you everyone for joining me tonight. And um, uh, went a little bit over time, but there's always so much to cover with anxiety. No that you have the power through your awareness and your choice to, um, to lessen and to manage your anxiety that will help your pain. All right, everyone, good night. Oh, you're welcome. Stuart, I'm glad you were able to come show up. You're welcome, everyone. Hmm. Um, Andrea, you should have gotten a confirmation. You can always register again. Uh, that's a good question because we've got so many things coming out. It might be getting a little confusing. Um, maybe go back in your, I can check and see if you, or why don't you go back in your emails and see if you got a confirmation and you'll, you'll see what you're signed up for. Yeah. And for the webinars, you always get a reminder a week before, a day before, and an hour before. So if you're not getting a reminder then um, a week before, then you aren't uh, registered. Right, there was a recent email with, yeah, you might just go to the, the most recent email, which would have been this last week, yeah. All right.